So in the last video, we talked about the idea of production efficiency and the idea that every step of the, of the links on the food chain, uh, less and less energy is going to become available because every single organism uh, doesn't necessarily assimilate 100% of the energy available to them when they do their eating behaviors. And they're also going to use some of the energy that they actually are, are consuming to do their daily activities. So, for example, the plant doesn't actually absorb 100% of the energy of the sun that hits it. And also, it uses some of the energy to maintain its life. Then, the, the herbivore that eats the plant, likewise, will not necessarily assimilate 100% of the energy. Some of it gets passed and doesn't get digested, it goes out of the feces. And then, the rest of that energy may get assimilated, but a lot of that energy is going to be used up in, to, for the animal to do what it needs to do. So... You have this idea of net primary production, which is the amount of energy that the plants produce, but then some of the energy is lost in the process of eating itself, and excretion, defecation, respiration, working, and that means that this net secondary production is going to be less as well. What that means is that every time, every step of the way in the food chain, as you go through the food web, less and less energy is available to higher trophic levels. Uh, so see here in the bottom, you see an example of a pyramid of energy. That the primary production amount, let's say if we have a thousand joules of energy, joules is the unit that you use to measure energy. By the way, notice that originally a million joules of sunlight were actually hitting the plant, but the plant only processed a bit of that and then actually used up the rest. So only 10,000 units of energy were added to, in, in terms of, of net primary productivity. But then, when the next animal ate that, the same thing happens. Some of the energy he uses, some of the energy, it doesn't get assimilated. It, that means that the secondary productivity is only 1,000 joules. By the time you get to the secondary consumer, that original energy that was a million is already down to 100. But the next level is down to 10. And if you have a level after that, it's down to 1. If you, if you have a level after that, it's down to 0 0.1. On average, each type of the way, each transfer of energy is going to be less and less efficient. And in fact, only between 5 to 25% of the energy is transferred. And on average, it's 10% is the magic number. 10% of the energy on average passes from each trophic level to the next. That's what you see on the top left on that pyramid of energy there. The rest of the energy is used up for, for the work, give up on its heat, or even never assimilated by the animal as he is doing the eating behavior. That has consequences on the ecosystem. If you have less energy available in each step of the way, that means that less mass can be supported on each step of the way as well. You're going to have a multitude, a large number of of producers, which also means you're going to have a lot of mass of producers, a standing crop. But then the herbivores which eat, eat, eat them will have to be less, because, and there's going to have to weigh less because there's less energy to support them. The same thing is true when you get to the next level. There's also going to be less secondary consumers and less mass of secondary consumers because, again, you're going to have less uh, energy available for that level. And you go up another level, this continues to be truth. And so what that means is that as you go higher and higher on the, on the ecosystem, you're going to see smaller and smaller numbers of, of, of the population of that level and smaller and smaller amount of energy at that level and also smaller and smaller biomass at that level because the energy is getting wasted as heat, as work, and things like that. So this is the idea of trophic efficiency, that throughout the food web, energy gets, uh, becomes less useful at each step of the way. And that's the whole idea of entropy that we talked about. As energy gets transferred from person to person, uh, some of the energy gets transferred to unusable types of energy like heat, and then you can no longer use it. Now, an interesting uh, thing that happens too is that because of this, Organisms at the higher level of the ecosystem are typically going to have to eat more because they are getting less energy because they're in the higher level. So something like an orca, for example, will have to eat a lot more biomass in order to get the same amount of energy that, it, that a zooplankton would get. So the efficiency of the eating behavior actually goes down as you go up. So that means they have to eat more often and they also have to eat a lot larger amounts. 
And because they typically have to beat everybody else, there's a tendency for them to either be larger or to be more specialized, better attackers in order to survive. So as you go higher in the food web, you will see, especially in aquatic food webs, you will see the size of the animals getting larger and larger. All right? And this is also true in many terrestrial food, web, food webs and food chains, but um, you can also, in, in the terrestrial food chains, instead of size, you can replace the size with powerful traits like speed, like awesome eyesight, like venom, uh, like strength. But wh whatever you look at it, all right, in, this means that the higher you get in the food chain, the better predator you have to become. In the water, that means size, because size is everything, although the speed is also a factor. They, they tend to be faster and faster as they, as, they, as they are going higher. But what matters here is something else, too. These specialized traits, size, poison, speed, they take a lot of energy to maintain, especially the whole size thing, which means that if you're going to have these huge, ginormous predators at the level of the food web that has the less amount of energy, what does that mean? It means that you're going to have very few of those top predators because you already have less energy available up there. You already have less numbers and less biomass available up there. Now, if this biomass and energy has to be concentrated in these huge organisms or these very highly specialized organisms, that means that there are going to be very few of them. And that's why there's so few lions compared to the number of gazelles, compared to the, the, the number of grass. All right, so it's yet another reason why the numbers get smaller and smaller as you go up in the food web. Does that make sense? Now, this also means that there may be limits to the size of the food web because big food webs will require amazing amount of energy in order to support. And uh, food chains, which are too large, are also going to be limited because every step of the way you're losing 10% of the energy. So if you started with a plant with uh, like 100% of the energy over here, by the time you get to the, the herbivore, you only have 10% of the energy. The second consumer is 1%. Over here is already 0.1. Over here is already 0 0.01 of the original energy. So that means that there, that limits how, how many links on the food chain there can be. And that's why in the wild there very rarely is very long food chains or very diverse food webs. And in order to have an incredibly diverse and long food web, you're going to need to have incredible amounts of productivity in order to maintain that. Now, another thing that I also want to talk about is the role of decomposers in this. Where do they fit in this, in this whole picture here? Now, when things die, no matter at what part of the food web they, they're at, any, everything that dies in the ecosystem is going to have to um, become like a carcass. Now, this carcass is going to be decomposed into smaller nutrients. So, all of those organic matter is going to be tr transferred back to nutrients to be used up by the producers again. So in an ecosystem, notice what's happening to the matter, all right? So the, the ecosystem, the producers are, are trapping the nutrients into their bodies, and then that's being transferred to the consumers. When the consumers died, the, the decomposers recycle those nutrients back to the producers. So that's what you're seeing on the outside in blue, is the idea that matter is constantly cycling through the ecosystem. Right? The same nutrients that were used by the producers in the first will travel through the food web, ultimately end up in, in, in detrivores and decomposers, which then uh, those nutrients are end up being used by the producers. So it's a cycle of matter. But the energy does not get transferred that way. In fact, the sunlight is the original source of the energy in most cases, but as each step of the way goes by, the, some of the energy is used for work and some of the energy is wasted as heat. What ends up happening at the end is that the energy just dissipates into space. And some of the energy, yes, gets trapped as chemical energy, but ultimately uh, all of the energy that was originally uh, added to the ecosystem by the producers gets wasted as heat in the ecosystem. So while the matter is recycled, the energy only flows through the ecosystem, and that's a very important concept. So what the decomposers are doing is that they're recycling the matter but the energy is pretty much becomes more less and less organized as you go higher higher up in the levels which means you need a constant influx of energy constant amount of sunlight to keep powering this engine of cycling the matter and that's very important in the idea of of the of the ecosystem all right now i hope you understood that on the next video i'm going to talk about a little bit of advanced topics about this it's not going to be a required video so i hope you understand energy flow in the ecosystem